Chapter 20 A Baby is Born Eerie Things About the Souls of the Dead About this time, the little girls took on an important task. They intended no less to rival their mothers and big sisters and themselves brew a few jars of chicha. In their dainty string bags, they dragged in supplies of the heavy tubers, peeled them, cut them up, and boiled them, chewed the native yeast to a pulp, and spat it into the jars. Summoning up every ounce of strength, they turned the heavy pestle and strained to mix the thick chicha until... After two days' hard work, it at last seemed to have enough flavor to offer to their fathers and brothers, who were connoisseurs, and the men made no secret of their enthusiasm for the zeal for work shown by these future housewives. They almost scrambled for the drink and behaved as if their children had at the last moment saved them from dying of thirst. And then the tribe had, in addition to its members, one of Peckirk's two wives gave birth to a girl. The mothers perform this business in a small hut a few steps away from the communal hut. After the birth, the young woman remains for a few days in the lying-in hut and then returns to the tribe with the new baby. Usually an ugly dark down grows over the whole head of Indian children from the eyes to the neck and this young mother hastened to shave the forehead of her little one with a sharp blade of grass and to paint on the little head which looked like a monkey's a perfect head of hair with black pigment she also pierced the lobes of her ears and drew through the holes fine threads which she twisted on her thighs from tender palm leaf fibers and she decorated the tiny little face like a grown-up's with black streaks and dots. I did not let the opportunity go by without looking for the Mongolian spot on the little one. Many Indians bear at birth as a reminder of their Mongolian ancestry a bluish mark in the region of the Kayaks. Usually the Indians lose this mark, which is about the size of a shilling, after a short time. Half caste children all over South America show this racial sign to the pleasure or the annoyance of their parents according to whether they are proud of their red extraction or not. In any case, the Tapari believed that no one was born without Paniyao Kod, and they thought I was trying to take them in when I assured them that our white children were born without the Mongolian spot. 25th of September, 1948. Pakurik is seriously worried. His baby often starts up screaming from her sleep at night. Today, her worried mother has painted a round mark on her crown with Uruku dye. This red mark on the back of her head is to scare away, once and for all, the Tarupa the evil spirit which frightens the poor little child at night. 26 of September, 1948. The days pass peacefully by. I help Vito in the fields, 
Kurumi has taken my gun to Salui to be repaired so that on my return journey I shall have a serviceable firearm at hand so I cannot hunt. To make up for it, I have been out several times to see an armadillo driven from its hole. When the Tatu goes back to his earth after seeking food, the hunters stop up the exit with dry palm leaves. Then they set fire to them, and with a fan quickly fashioned from tender palm fronds, they drive the smoke into the hole. The armadillo tries to escape from the smarting smoke, but in a trice, the watchful Indian brings down a club or a bush knife on his head. If, however, there is no fire available, the hunters have to possess themselves in greater patience. They stop up the exit until the armadillo, driven by hunger, crawls out and gets into the basket. In vain, it tries to force its way through the plated creepers, and before it scents danger and can withdraw into its hole again, the hunter sends an arrow through its thin armor. The only big game in the Tapari district is the tapir, a harmless, clumsy herbivore which can be likened to a donkey whose legs have turned out too short and on whom nature, in a freakish mood, has placed a long-snouted pig's head. Often we see the deep tracks of his three-toed feet on the banks of the small streams, as well as on the hunting paths. Yes, the tapirs make themselves proper paths through the bush, and to the great amusement of the Indians, I often lost my way following such broad beaten tracks. In the dry season, the tapirs usually make their escape from the swarms of big and little gadflies into the cool waters of the streams, and then when these thick-skinned animals are wallowing in the pleasant bath with only the tips of their noses showing, the Indians creep up cautiously and shoot their lance-shaped arrows through their hide. It was just such a hunting party that Quarume was planning, and he amiably invited me to join them. Unfortunately, he seems to have had second thoughts about it. Before he set out with his family, he apologized sadly and in embarrassment. It would be better if I stayed at home, he said. With my nailed shoes, I should make too much noise on the gravel of the brooks and give these shy animals premature warning. So I was not allowed to hunt peers. To make up for it, I went fishing with Valete and the well-built Voya Tisiri. Near the Maloka, only very small streams wind through the woods, and of course there are no big fish there. But now, in the dry season, a pool here and there swarms with little creatures, seldom bigger than a finger. To catch these little fish, the Tapari have a well-tried method, poison. On the way, Valete and his son collected a few bunches of a poisonous liana and cut two handy hardwood clubs. Then we descended the steep slope to a small stream. I took my shoes off and hung them over my back. I barked my toes on the slippery pebbles. It is true, but in the jungle one cannot afford to be too susceptible to pain. We followed the narrow bed of the stream for a good while. At every turn we found distinct tracks. Other members of the tribe had already tried their luck at, as fishermen here. Finally, we came upon a large pool which seemed not yet to have been finished. My companions laid one of the bundles on a flat stone. 
on the bank and beat the lianas with their clubs. Then they stirred it round in the water, crushed it again with powerful blows, and again swirled it round. The poison in this liana must be really strong, for the fishes were already beginning to appear on the surface, gasping for air, and were soon drifting belly uppermost in the scarcely perceptible current. I rolled up my trousers and helped to gather the catch. Valete and Voyatisiri went to work quite systematically. Not a corner of the extensive pool was spared from the poison, and in every cleft of the big stone blocks they stirred round their bundles of lianas. Hours passed like this until there was no longer any hope that a single fish was left alive, far and wide, on the sandy bank. Lay some two hundred fishes of all kinds, some of which looked like sardines, while others had flat, wide mouths and long tentacles. The two Indians packed them carefully in large soroka, leaves, and then we set out on our journey home. Again and again, my companions would bend down to pick up a stone, and if they were lucky, there would be a small crab hiding beneath it or some other water creature, which they would then place between their strong teeth and crunch with relish. The 28th of September, 1948, the hunting craze has seized the whole tribe. Today, almost all the Tapari left the Maloka in small groups. In their left hand, they carried their bows and a thick bundle of arrows, and on their backs, a small traveling hammock and a few corn cobs. They intend to hunt and to poison fish for five or even ten days. Many of them took their wives and children to the hunting grounds. Vito has suggested that I should interrupt my work in the fields as well, but I cannot leave the Maloka now. Senor Ungle has sent word by Idum that he is expecting any day the consignment of axes and knives, which he will then immediately send on here. If I am not here when the things arrive, Lord knows what will happen to them. Besides, my gun is still in Saloui. Vito seemed a little disgruntled. You can shoot apes with Kurumi's gun, he objected. But Kurumi's gun is such a gim-crack affair that I would not trust myself to fire even a single shot with it. Vito has now given up the pleasure of a hunting trip, lasting several days, probably the first time in his life he has ever done so, and so there are still three able-bodied men in the Maloka, Vito, the old magician Quayo, and myself. For some time, Tonga, the chief's cousin, has been behaving differently than she did. She no longer looks at me, but pointedly keeps out of my way, nor does she bring me chicha any longer, and young Conquad no longer takes me to her place in the hut for a feast of cooked groundnuts and other tidbits. Her friend Kamatsuka is neglecting me in a way which is positively criminal, and with a rumbling stomach. I often wonder whether these women have plotted to starve me if I do not finally capitulate and take Tonga as my wife. Almost every day, Kamatsuka orders me to go into the forest alone with the young woman to fetch firewood. Kobkob, Ara, Etara, E, Atsi, E, Ana, Vatsikadakara, Ne, Kun. Now, just you go with your bride and chop some wood. If you don't, I shall be very angry with you. I am quite prepared to fetch wood, but to go into the forest with a single woman amounts, in the eyes of the Tapari, 
to have having an understanding with her, for it is taken as a matter of course that on such occasions things do not stop at getting wood. Vito, too, lets me see how bitterly I have disappointed him. He has probably realized that I do not wish to marry either his cousin or any other Tapari woman, and that I am really thinking of leaving him and his tribe sooner or later for good. The only thing he cannot understand is why I have stayed with him so long in the first place, why I have interested myself so much in Tapari affairs and taken the trouble to learn the language and note it down. The 2nd of October, 1948. The logic of these women is inexorable. Either marry or starve. The days of plenty, when I hardly knew what to do with the various dishes, seem for once to be over. I hope not forever, for I am getting thinner every day, and I still do not know when I can start on my trek back to Salawi. But the chief has to suffer as well from the moods of his wives. Yesterday evening I sat outside the hut and was eating what an old neighbor had given me out of charity. Vito squatted beside me, working in silence on an arrow. Out of politeness I offered him some of my miserable maize. Ravenously hungry, the chief fell to. What ha haven't you eaten anything yet? I asked him in surprise. I haven't had a thing all day, he confessed, rather de dejectedly. His wives had cooked nothing. One of them, Api Nuitsa, lay in her hammock with her chronic stomach ache, and the other, Kamatsuka, did not cook him anything either. She was sulking again. So it can happen that the highest dignitary in the tribe has to go to bed on an empty stomach. Why? An Indian from the next hut told me a day or two ago in confidence, Vito doesn't beat his wives, because you are here and you always say that women should not be beaten. But when you go away, he will be as wild as before and knock Apinuitsa and Kamatsuka about. I don't want anything to happen to the gentle Apinuitsa. She really does suffer from bad stomach pains of which neither I nor the magicians can make anything, and for which we have vainly tried everything. But as far as Kamatsuka is concerned, she probably does need a good thrashing from time to time. Then she will soon forget to sulk, and she will also learn how to cook again. 3rd of October, 1948 the men are still far away on their hunting trips, and wanderlust has seized the women as well. In large and small groups, they set off early all over the forest, and a really uncanny silence descended on our settlement. It was evening before they came back, and with what they had caught. This consisted principally of little fishes which they had caught by emptying out small pools. In addition, there were crabs and other shellfish, larvae, crickets, beetles, and caterpillars of every kind. They now stewed these in mokekas over their domestic fires, and they also roasted maize and grilled tubers. Night came on, and the hut, which had before been as silent as the grave, now buzzed with chatter, for today there were no unkind men to order them to be silent. Many were the tales told of where each one had been, what they had seen, and what choice things they had discovered. Two women had even come upon the fresh tracks of a big jaguar. It was not until late at night that the noise subsided, and while far away in the forest, the men keep watch over their cooking grids and probably doze off at intervals. Here at home, women and children are dreaming of the exertions and experiences of this unusual day. Towards the end of the week, 
the hunters returned and brought home much else beside the game they had bagged. In their pouches they brought bundles of whitish palm straw and lumps of sticky resin carefully packed in leaves. They boiled the strips of palm leaf and combed them out until they could properly bunch together the long stranded fibers. From this they intended to twist the thread which smeared with black resin they use for fastening the feathers to their arrows. They beat up the fresh resin with charcoal into the tough black mass which renders the threads firm and even serves as a cement for all kinds of handiwork. A magic session was also held in the middle of it all. I was again allowed to sit behind the pile of wood near the door and take photographs. It was well worth it. Not only did I again manage to take a few dramatic pictures, but I saw some incantations which I had never yet observed. In the course of the ceremony, the head magician got up and paced with upraised arms through the whole hut. He groped all round in the air and seemed to be seeking something with great care. What is happening? I asked Togu Ruru, who sat nearest to me. Be quiet and don't move, whispered the old man. Vito is looking for the Tarupa, who has made Torao sick. Torao sat in the circle of the men and waited apathetically for his brother-in-law, the chief magician, to deal with the evil spirit. Then Vito seemed to have found the Tarupa. With both hands he grasped the invisible being, carefully carried it to the door, and with a powerful gesture thrust it out into the open. The congregation sighed with audible relief. The session now pursued its accustomed course for hours and hours. When the snuff-taking company finally broke up, Vito still had an incantation to make. He moved up to his sick brother-in-law and submitted him to quite unusual course of healing. Up to now, I had always seen the medicine men draw the diseases from their limbs <clears throat> of the patients who sought their help only by means of sucking and spitting. But today Vito did not stop at this. The malady seemed obstinate, and a call for more effective remedies. The sick man's wife, Vito's sister, Aboika, brought along a huge mokeka, and to my astonishment, the magician unwrapped a whole roasted sapajo monkey from the leaves, which were scorched. Vito was in deadly earnest. He told me to fetch a knife and cut off the monkey's head. I obeyed in some surprise, whereupon Vito hissed angrily, Hurry up and give me the head, and don't stamp about so loudly on the ground. I handed him the head and crept to my place. The chief turned to the sick man again. Turao was squatting with closed eyes, and the magician stroked the whole of his body with the monkey's head amid many incantations and strange sounds, breathing and clicking of his tongue. At last, Torao was allowed to withdraw. Vito looked at me again, this time in a more friendly fashion, and no longer held back from me the explanation of the strange ceremony. A magician from the Bayoro tribe had come to the Tapari some time before to look for a wife for his wife had died, and the Vayoro had fewer women than men, but none of the single Tapari women would marry him and leave the tribe, and no father was willing to give up his daughter. Furious at this snub, the wooer returned to his tribe, and in revenge sent out an evil charm. 
the charm struck Torao, and until today, none of the tribe's medicine men had been able to drive it out. Vito's last hope was the head of the whistling monkey, which has the power to suck diseases out of the body and eat them up. Torao will now soon be well, said the chief confidently, and raised, in conclusion of the ceremony, a bowl full of chicha towards the dome of the hut. He had, he had to offer this to the Vamawa Apoga pod, he explained, the souls of departed magicians, because they had helped him during his incantations. Thus the Tapari consider themselves linked in a special way with the supernatural world and have a strange conception of the continuance of human life after death. Ever since the young magician Potty, on that unforgettable moonlit night, first told me about the souls of the dead, the Pabed, I have followed up these matters again and again with particular keenness. It was no light work, for it is precisely its supernatural matters like this that such vocabulary as I have in common with the Tapari fails me utterly, and yet as the weeks went by I was at last able to find out a thing or two from them. When a Tupari dies, then the pupils of his eyes leave him and change into a Pabid. The Pabid does not walk the earth like living men, but his path to the realm of the dead leads over the backs of two great crocodiles and two giant snakes, a male and a female. Ordinary folk cannot see these crocodiles, only the magicians see them in their dreams. Often the snakes rear up towards the sky, and when it rains they become visible to everybody. That is the rainbow. The pobid then strides over the backs of the snakes and the crocodiles to the village of the dead. He also passes two huge jaguars who frighten him with their roars, but who cannot do anything to him. At last, the dead man reaches his new home, which lies on the big river Mani Mani, but he sees nothing of all this for his eyes are still closed. He is first received by two fat worms, a male and a female. They bore a hole in his belly and eat all of his intestines. Then they crawl out again. Now comes Patobeka, the head magician and chief of the Maloka of the dead. He sprinkles stinging pepper juice into the newcomer's eyes, and now, for the first time, the Pobid sees where he has come to. In astonishment, he looks about him and sees nothing but strangers. They all have hollow bellies because the worms have eaten their bowels and their teeth are nothing but short stumps. Sadly, he asks Patakobakia, Where am I and who are all these people? These are your parents. These are your brothers and sisters, laughs Patabakia scornfully, but this is a cruel lie. The Pabid sees neither parents nor brothers and sisters, but only strange beings staring dully at him. Then I really have died and gone to the Pabid, says the dead man, and with the horror he notices that he too has only short stumps left for teeth and no bowels. Then Patabakia hands him a bowl of chisha. The new Pabid drinks it, and Patabakia leads him further into the village of the dead. There, an old couple of giant primeval magicians await the newcomer. If he is a man, he must, in full view of everyone, copulate with the ancient giantess Vague, but if the Pobid is a woman, she must give herself 
to old Macalero. Later, the Pobid no longer have intercourse in the usual human manner, but the men breathe on a bundle of leaves and throw it at the backs of the women, and in this way they become pregnant and bear children. The Pobid live in large round huts. They have no hammocks, but sleep standing up in the hut. They lean against the supporting post and cover their eyes with their arms. They clear no woods and plant no fields. Patobakia does all this with a magic gesture of his hand and with his magic breath. The chicha, which the Pobid women brew from ground nuts, does not ferment, and so the dead men cannot get drunk. However, they frequently sing and dance in their full array of feathers, and the Dupari's magicians hear their songs when they visit the Pobid's village in their dreams. If ever a Pobid falls, if he eats papas, the Pobid's papas are much bigger and sweeter than those of the living, and make sick men well and old men young again. This was what the Tapari had to tell of the Pobid, but I soon found out that they are not content with an afterlife lived by one soul. On the contrary, their tales were haunted by the ghostly presence of a second soul, which does not go to the Maloka of the Pobid, but which, for some time after death, floats away somewhere to distant heights. When someone dies and the pupils of his eyes go off to the Pobid, then we bury him in the hut or where we have burnt down an old hut. Immediately the heart begins to grow in the dead man's body, and after a few days it is as big as the head of a child. Inside the heart springs up a little man who grows bigger and bigger and bursts out open from the heart, just as a bird breaks its shell. This is the Ki Apoga pod, but he cannot crawl out of the ground. And weeps with hunger and thirst. The relatives of the dead man therefore go hunting. When they come back, they hold three sessions of snuff-taking with the magicians. The chief magician draws the ki apoga pod from the ground, cleans him, and shapes his face and limbs. For when he comes out of the ground, he is still unformed clay. Then the magician gives him something to eat and drink and lets him loose in the air. Up there the Ki Apoga Pod live, but if the dead man was a magician, then the Apoga Pod does not float away to those distant places, but stays in the Maloka. There the souls of the dead magicians eat our food and drink our chicha. Down from the dome of the hut they cast a spell on us, at night and produce our dreams. The souls of the dead wives of the magicians also hover up there. The Tapari knew a lot more besides about the fate which awaits us after death, and they were acquainted with an astonishing number of invisible beings which live in the sky in distant regions and even under the earth. They also had a clear idea about the origin of man and the nature of the stars, and they had many wonderful things to relate from the legends of the tribe and of neighboring peoples. Unfortunately, as I have said, the only difficulty was understanding what we said to one another, but once I thought I had grasped something, I sat down beside another informant and questioned him about the same story. Often he was amazed and wondered where I could have found out so much. Then he would correct me here and there and add much else that he had heard from his parents or grandparents. 
And finally, I had a complete picture of how these forest dwellers explain the hereafter and all the things which the human spirit is, I suppose, predisposed to speculate on whether the inquirer is a highly civilized savant or a naked Indian in the tropical jungle. Small wonder that during such exciting investigations I greatly neglected my photographs. A contributory factor was the suspicion and uneasiness which many men and women showed when I leveled the camera at them, and so now I photographed almost out of a sense of duty the long list of subjects which I had drawn up during the preceding months as being essential, and yet the art of photography found two new devotees, Vito and his son, Conquad. I had taught them how to hold the Leica, look through the viewfinder, and release the shutter. At first they had hung back dubiously, but now the sound of the shutter seemed to be heavenly music in their ears. At the same time, they gained a certain confidence if I let myself be photographed by them without any fear. Then there could be, could not be, any evil spell attached to this strange apparatus. They therefore need have no misgivings about being taken by me. Slowly I began to prepare for my trek back. I believed that I had now learnt the essentials of Tapari customs and beliefs, and I had taken enough photographs for my purpose. I was particularly pleased to think that many of the pictures of the magic ceremonies had probably turned out well. I now wanted to engage in a little barter with my neighbors in order to have some souvenirs to take home. Then Vito realized that I was serious about leaving, and that neither the prospect of becoming a chief <clears throat> nor his pretty little daughter Kabatoa or the hard-working Tonga could bind me to the tribe, so he decided to accompany me as far as St. Louis. First, however, we should have to sow the maize and have two big chicha parties, he decreed. Only then could we set out. When shall we sow the maize? I asked. His wives and daughters had already picked out two jarfuls of seeds and placed them in readiness behind the hut. The ground is now hard and dry, explained Vito. When it rains, then we will sow maize. And he looked at me as if to ask, Are you really as stupid as all that? Or are you only pretending to be? Any child knows that you can't sow maize when the soil is dried up. So I had to possess my soul in patience for a while longer. Vito, however, took care that time should not hang heavy on my hands. Day after day, he took me off to his fields in the newly cleared field. I had to knock endless rows of holes in the ground in which the chief's wives planted teoba and yam tubers. However much I sweated and sighed in the broiling sun, Vito was inflexible, and his wives waited patiently with the roots for planting. Some strips had not been burnt entirely clear. Vito did not seem inclined to lose this ground. When the forthcoming maize sowing took place, and so we too had to set about it with a will, and then we finally had a lot of trouble on the yucca field. My yucca field, in replanting several patches, which the men had left untouched out of sheer slackness during the communal planting. The men are lazy and no good, complained Vito somberly. Only I, Vito, and you, Francisco, 
are industrious and do much work, and indeed it seemed no easy job to be a Tapari chief. He had to work several times as hard as an ordinary tribesman. Vito took this as a matter of course, but he also took it as a matter of course that I would help him to the limit of my powers in all he undertook. As a matter of fact, he had once asked me whether my father was a chief in the tribe of Suizos, and I had thoughtlessly said that he was. But now I had to show that I was a worthy chief's son, and not afraid to work. Chapter 21 Tapari Wedding Had Hunters in Sight My thoughts lingered half with the Tapari and their spirits and souls of the dead, and half with distant civilization. It seemed to me as if I had left the world of the whites not just a few months before, but years ago. I was fed up with life among the Indians. I wanted to see something fresh again, and I did not dream what surprises still awaited me. One evening, Vito let fall some, some strange remarks about Ninkiab, the daughter of the chief next door, to whom Itam had paid his addresses. I could not make sense of what he said, but obviously something special was in train. Next morning I went into the neighboring hut and found a part of Quavrume's quarters separated off by a screen of poles and straw mats. I looked through the narrow entrance and saw Niankambab sitting on the ground. Kabatoa, Vito's little daughter, had come with me, and I looked at her inquiringly. Ninkiab will get nothing to eat or drink for five days, and she must sit here. People might see her blood, explained the little girl shyly. Iharipad Kara ne on. Are you hungry? I asked Ninkiab, who squatted there pale and thin, not daring to look up. Vari pawed Kara on. She whimpered and went on turning her spindle. I discreetly withdrew and once again had subject matter on which to question and cross-question my friends for days until it seemed to me that I had at last found out the strange mortifications of the flesh little Ninkiab was subjected to and the whole general procedure with Tapari marriage. When a Tapari has reached an understanding with a girl, then a solemn interview takes place with the father, and a price is offered, bows, arrows, espadas, or or ornaments, which the young man is particularly skilled in making. With a modern Tapari father, however, it may well happen that he is not satisfied with this, but requires the suitor first to go and earn an axe, or at least a bush knife from the whites. If the bridegroom is a young man, he goes with his hammock and personal belongings to live with his father-in-law and has to work with him. An older suitor, and particularly a chief, is not required to do this. He simply takes the young woman as his wife. Often the Indians marry quite small girls, but it is an unwritten law for a Tapari that he will not touch the girl until she is considered mature according to the general custom of the tribe, that is, until she has been through the initiation ceremony for girls. The Tapari seem to attach much more importance to this ceremony than to the wedding, and until it has taken place, there is no cohabitation. When a girl first observes the signs of her maturity, 
Her mother reports the fact to the head magician. Without delay, a wall of poles and palm leaf mats is put up in the maloka, and the girl kept in confinement behind it. For five days, she receives neither food nor drink, until at last the magician blesses a little jar of thick, unfermented shisha for her, and during the months which follow this kind of chicha forms the young woman's sole nourishment. Above all, she must not touch meat or fish. She is not allowed to leave her retreat, to bathe, or to wash. She remains squatting on the ground or in her little hammock, spinning cotton in order to make a hammock for her husband later on. If she has a husband, she is forbidden to see him or talk to him during the whole of this time. Only after two or three months is she released. The girl's husband and her nearest relatives go off hunting for ten days, but the girl must fast strictly for another five days, and the woman smear her head with damp, putrid earth in order to soften the roots of her hair. When the hunters come back, the magicians arrange a ceremony with them. All those taking part sniff tobacco dust and ampe, and the head magician utters a wealth of detailed incantations over the starving bride. The woman pull out her hair and her body and her plucked skull are painted with red and black pigment. Almost fainting from the rigors of her fast, the bride at last has her first food stuffed into her mouth by the magician. Once all these tortures and magic rites have been endured, the bride returns to the community of her tribe, but not until her hair has grown again. Properly is she allowed to live with her husband. Nor is the marriage ever final until children arrive. Only when a child is born do the couple belong together for life. Young boys and girls, therefore, who find that they have been given to the wrong partner or that they have made a wrong choice can cancel the bargain if they are quick. And once one is tired of marriage, a pretext for separation is easily found. Tisido, for example, declared that the only reason he had given up his uncommonly pretty bride was that she had had too fat a belly, and Tisonim, according to her own account, had left her first husband from the Arakapu tribe because his lips were too thick and his buttocks too fat and wobbly. A somewhat darker complexion than usual, or even an unlovely skin disease in the partner provided, sufficient grounds for separation. But I also heard more serious complaints. A woman had already lost two husbands because she bore no children. Laziness and unfaithfulness on the part of the wife are counted especially important grounds for separation, and what drove many a wife away from her husband was his violent temperament and his bad habit of beating her or even shooting at her when he was drunk. All this I picked up gradually on long leisure evenings when we sat down while out hunting to take a little rest or during the carousals when there was nothing to distract my attention, and the Tapari were especially ready to confide to me good or preferably bad things about their wives and fellow tribesmen. During the day, there was not much time for conversation. There was still work enough and to spare if the tribe wanted to be able to face the coming year with quiet confidence. The chief's big fields were, it is true, prepared for sowing and already partly planted with yuccas, but the other men still had their small clearings to attend to. They could not bank on the mass assistance of the whole tribe 
as the chiefs could. They worked with their wives and children and a few good friends, which usually numbered Vito and myself, his constant companion. And so these weeks until the rains should at last set in and the signal given for planting maize were fully taken up with burning the clearings, planting them out, and with hunting and fish poisoning. If now and again an idle morning really did occur, then the men devoted themselves with enthusiasm to the game of head ball. They stood facing each other in two teams, knocked the rubber ball backwards and forwards, and whenever the ball rolled away, or a player touched it with his hand or foot, his team lost a point, and according to their luck or skill, the Indians won or lost many an arrow at it. However, before they put up such an arrow as a prize, they rubbed it devoutly in their armpits. If you smell of me, then you will come back to me. Once more I sat in my hammock, writing up my diary. About half the men were out hunting. The others were dozing or working away at an arrow or a bow. One particularly skillful young man was sticking delicate pieces of toucan feather on a thin strip of wood to make himself an unusually handsome peg for his nose. Then the hunting party returned, and suddenly a great commotion seemed to turn the whole hut upside down. Again and again I heard the name of Homno, the grim head hunters of whom the Tapari had so often told me. With fear in his eyes, Karandera, one of the hunters, reported to me, Over there, two days, journey away, we have seen the footprints of the Homno, and shavings from bamboo arrows and cudgels freshly broken off. Karandera had followed the trail <clears throat> and had clearly heard the ominous voices of the Homno, just as the grandfathers of the tribe used to imitate them, he said, Tajuru, the pot-bellied magician, had also been in the party. He wanted, he wasted no time talking, but went into the forest, cut down a paksuba palm, cut up the trunk into long planks, and boarded up the back entrance of the hut where he lived, only a few of the inhabitants in the next hut were at home, and they made great haste to follow Tajuru's example. They plaited thick mats from palm leaves and carefully fitted them over the doorway. They wanted to prevent the homno from being able to shoot <clears throat> into the hut from the safe cover of the nearby bush. Then they took out their work baskets and the bundles of stems for making arrows and small strips of palm wood in order hurriedly to cut fresh arrows and complete those which were half made. Two or three more hunting groups came home and heard with concern the news of the approach of the Homno. The mood was one of gloom and solemn conversations took place round the fires Suddenly, on the next afternoon, two shots rang out in nearby in the nearby forest, and soon after, Kurumi and his companions, heavily laden, came striding over the square. After a month, they were at last back from Saloui, and they brought a precious load. Signor Angle had sent letters, the patched-up shotgun, powder, shot, and priming, soap, and other things, and for the Tapari, the tools. Which had been promised to them, each of the workers would receive either an axe or a bush knife, 
I was to superintend the distribution, but it was not as simple as it seemed. They would all far rather have had an axe, and many an Indian made a wry face at me, as if I ought to be able to convert a bush knife into good steel axes. The joy over the safe return of the messengers and the tools was rudely interrupted. At twilight, two lads came running into the hut with more grim tidings on the edge of the wood, where one of the many paths led to the settlement. They had seen two strange men. They had been spying from out of the bush on the activity on the square, and when they felt themselves to be observed, they had vanished into the bush. Such was the story which the lads told disconcertedly. The men and women rushed about in great alarm. The humno, the humno, was the cry on all sides. Vito the chief was on the spot at once. He too seemed very concerned, but he did not lose his head. Give me your gun and many cartridges, he demanded of me. You can shoot with the pensin. Pensin means little bow, and by this he meant the revolver. I obeyed him in silence and filled my trouser pockets with revolver bullets. Kurumi and Idum, agitation written on their faces, also joined us holding their guns at the ready. The other Indians took up their bows and arrows, and cautiously the lads led us to the place where they had seen the strange men spying. There were two homno. They stood here and ran away when we saw them. They assured us. Pursuit was out of the question, but what was to be done? The chief fired a few shots. He told Kurumi and Idum to do the same, and I followed suit with my revolver, as if war were descending on the country. In grim earnest, the peaceful clearing echoed to the sound of our shots. The dogs came out of the house barking, and the boys seemed to find the den great fun despite everything. Now the homno will be frightened and not come back, said Vito. Tomorrow we will shoot again, once more the day after, and so on every evening. None the less the men patrolled all night long with bows and arrows between their sleeping places and the door and peered out onto the moonlit square. Kurumi, that man of the world, was seized by panic. Let us leave here and go to the Tapari, to Regino. Here the homno will shoot us dead and eat our heads. He cried, but the ungainly Tabia took down from his store shelf a huge gourd trumpet. Other tribesmen followed his example, and the night then echoed with eerie, long-drawn-out sounds. Everyone, old and young, joined in with a blood-curdling war cry. Cold shivers ran down my spine. What sort of company had I fallen in with? And now they were in the right frame of mind to recount for the hundredth time the grisly tales of the wicked headhunters. It was late before I lay down to sleep, fully dressed and with my loaded revolver in my hand. Times out of number, I started up from my troubled dreams, bathed in sweat, but morning dawned without the slightest incident having occurred. The whole morning the boys played head ball on the square as if they had quite forgotten the excitement of the evening before. But the older folk, in whom the memory of the terrible times of days gone by was still vivid, sat deep in earnest conversation and worked tirelessly at new arrows to shoot Homno with. Kurumi and Idum, the two brothers-in-law, squatted down beside me, and together we put fresh priming in the empty cartridge cases, filled them up with powder and shot, 
knocking it home with a wad of fine wood shavings, which the Indians had collected when scraping bows and espadas. A particular worry preoccupied Vito. His brother, Iod, had not yet come back from a hunting expedition, and who could tell whether he had not fallen into the hands of the spying Homno? If Iod does not appear tomorrow, we will all set out and shoot Homno, he announced with a deadly solemn face. Now we have three guns and enough powder and shot. Whether on this campaign I was to go along with my revolver or whether he intended to leave me behind with the women and children to protect them, he did not make clear for the moment. To everyone's relief, the missing men came back home that same evening, heavily laden with spoils of all kinds. They were besieged with the sensational news, but Iod did not seem very disturbed. He said nonchalantly that the two lads must have been taking us in, and soon I was also wondering what to make of the affair. Had the two fellows, after all, hoaxed us, or had they been the victims of their own imagination? Were they trying to create a sensation, or merely looking for a pretext to leave the tribe forever and go to the whites in St. Louis? Vito remained serious. Every evening he loosed off a few shots outside the Maloka to the accompaniment of shrill cries from the boys and the barking of the dogs. At last he considered that the danger was probably over for this time. Doubtless the Homno had seen on the plantations that the trees had no longer been chopped down in the old way with stone axes, but with new, unknown tools, and doubtless these wild neighbors were forced to conclude that the simple tapari of the day, old days no longer lived here. And if then, in addition, they heard the shots, they would be thoroughly alarmed and no longer venture into this vicinity. I, on the other hand, was plagued with a fresh worry. Would the tapari be able in such circumstances to bring themselves to leave their wives and children alone in order to carry my baggage to St. Louis? Or should I have to spend the whole rainy season in this maloka until the chief considered that the danger from the east was finally disposed of? Lastly, the possibility that the headhunters might actually come in hordes and attack the maloka was one I dared not dwell upon in detail. Only in my troubled dreams did I sometimes see my head bubbling away between ground nuts and yucca with a grim Indian woman prodding impatiently at it with her ladle to see whether it was done. For the first time I did not see the sun rise over the Tapari Maloka. The rainy season was beginning. Tiny drops fell incessantly. Then Vito decided to sow the first maize, and I took fresh hope that my stay with the Tapari might slowly be nearing its end. But at the same time a painful sensation stole upon me unawares. I felt, as never, never before, that these naked people, at first so strange and often repellent, had become, in the course of months, close friends and good neighbors. There was no one in all this huge hut who had not offered me, when I was hungry, a roast tuber, a papa, or a bowl of chicha, with a friendly word, all in their own way, were considered about my welfare, and equally they all knew that I had grown to like them as much as they liked me. Babies had meanwhile been born, others had learnt to walk under my very eyes, and I had let them ride on my back. Only two or three little fellows were still afraid of my beard, the others were not afraid to pull it, and they all called me, familiarly, their grandfather, or even Toto Omsiton, grandfather with the long nose. Imperceptibly, I had entered into the life and work of the tribe.
The Indians had grown used to me and I to them, and despite many hardships, it just seemed to me that things must now go on like this forever, since Idum had come from Saloui, and with him a not noticeably alien atmosphere. It struck me how many little habits I had already taken over from the Tapari. I no longer nodded my head to show assent, but drew a loud, deep breath through my mouth, as they did. I no longer ate with my mouth shut, as I had been taught in the nursery, but opened it wide, for in the jungle only monkeys eat with their mouths closed, because they are afraid that a morsel might fall out. After meals, I belched uninhibitedly to show that I was really full, to eat from the same pot as the Indians and to drink from their unwashed calabashes seemed to me the most natural thing in the world. Equally, as a matter of course, the chief would pick up my spoon during our meals together and put away a mouthful. I had long since lost the habit of raising my hand to my mouth when I coughed or yawned, and if ever an unpleasant smell assailed my nostrils, I cleared my throat and spat like the Indians. The few formulas they used in greeting had also become familiar to me, and I had unconsciously picked up much else besides. All this helped to efface more and more the difference between me and my hosts, or at least to make me forget it. The strange variety of objects in my baggage soon caused to rouse any special interest the only thing they still could not really get used to was being photographed. On the other hand, I had had to hold my wrist watch to their ears countless times, and Vito's special joy seemed to be my pocket torch. During the nights when a party was held, the wisest thing to do was to hide it from him, for he took the utmost delight in shining it in the eyes of those who were asleep or drunk, or searching the surroundings of the hut to see whether he could not perhaps discover a couple making love on the quiet. But when I dismantled the torch into its separate parts, even the oldest woman in the hut came hurrying to the scene, and there seemed to be no end to unscrewing and putting it together again. Of course, the radio at first seemed positively uncanny. I had explained as well as I could how it was that music and talk came from the magic box. But even after some months, a boy asked me in which of the valves the girl who sang so sweetly was sitting in which one the musician sat, and where the man with the deep <clears throat> bass voice was, and one old woman in utter bewilderment summed up her astonishment in the words, Kire Amon, you're not human beings, any of you. But later the Tapari thought that, compared with the achievements of their magic priest, the radio did not really represent anything very special, for the souls of the magicians, when they are asleep, or when they sniff Aimpe, go on fabulous journeys, and they hear the voices and songs of the spirits in heaven, and the souls of the dead, even without the help of any apparatus. For a long time, the Indians simply could not see the point of writing. Why scribble on paper for hours and make such uneven strokes above and below the line? If only I would decorate the white sheets with a beautiful zigzag line without the ugly pot hooks and hangers. And really, these tarupa they did not even have a central parting on their heads, 
one evening before a carousal when I was sitting all unsuspecting with the chief's family outside the hut, Kamatsuka suddenly picked on me. She had just been plucking hairs from Tonga's eyebrows and temples with a twisted thread, and now she told me plainly that it was my turn. She wanted to pluck the hair from my temples, eyebrows, and beard too. Karom pod am on. You're not a grandfather. I resisted energetically, but the chief's vigorous wife would not let me go out until she had at last achieved one thing. Using my comb, she parted my hair in the middle and could not see any reason why I should try to prevent it. Don't you see that your nose is in the middle? She ran her hand up my nose and on to the fresh parting. So your hair must also be parted in the middle. The day of the great maize sowing had come. The whole tribe was summoned. Early in the morning, the chief was already <clears throat> fortifying his little band for the important work with freshly brewed chicha. The men now paced out the extensive field littered with charred tree trunks and with long stakes pierced holes in the ground which the rain had softened. The women followed in their wake, threw in the grains of maize, and scraped a little earth over them with their foot. Vito superintended the work. He warned the young men to be careful, and here and there checked to see that every place had received the necessary seed. The work was over by midday. The chief, his followers, and also the people from the next hut gathered outside the huts and solemnly exchanged cooked ground nuts and yuccas with one another. The women and girls danced by the light of the moon until late into the night, but the men got into their hammocks and slept. About this time, the other clearings were also sown with maize, and then one morning the Indians went off into the forest with bow and arrow, axe on shoulder, and a bottle gourd. Hunting was not the main object today, but in the evening every man returned with a gourd full of honey. The women and children received the combs with the pollen and the larvae, and the men kept the honey for themselves and thinned it down with water. When the sun was low on the horizon, they carried the sweet drink outside the hut and set out the jars in a long row. Not a woman showed herself on the square. Amid cheerful chatter and jest, the men drank their fill and vomited when necessary. Drinking honey water was an old custom, Vito explained obviously expecting me to say that it was a very pleasant one. In days gone by, we danced in the evening and all night long, but the young people don't make feather ornaments or want to dance any longer, he added sadly, so the Tapari's customs had not altogether escaped the effects of their visits to the white men and the civilized Indians in Salui. Even the, this distance away, the colony of rubber gatherers on the Rio Branco, uncouth as it was, exerted an influence. There was no culture there, but only greedy snatching at quick profits, with life a mere vegetable existence without plan or purpose. The whites had nothing to give the Indians except perhaps an axe or a knife, and occasionally a shirt or a pair of trousers, but all unnoticed they were taking away from them whatever the older generation had bequeathed them in the way of sensible traditions. Many a Tapari realized the danger from the encroaching customs of the Sivilicados, but there were many others who dreamed of shirts and trousers, powder and shot, tarupa, salt and sugar, 
heaven knows what the visitor will find in those jungles in another ten or twenty years' time. All the maize was sown, and hardly anyone was still talking about the head-eating homno. I then asked the chief once more when we should at last set off for Salouy. But the women had just brought a huge pile of yuccas and yams from his plantation, and it looked as if celebrations were about to begin again. We will sing and dance and drink this chicha of mine, was Vito's answer. Then the women will fetch the yuccas from Iod's field, and we will once more sing and dance and drink chicha. When the chicha is all drunk, we will go to Salouy. I had got used to not contradicting the chief, and so I bowed to these last instructions of his, although I feared that during the next few days the rainy season might set in with full force. Two more chicha festivals. That meant three days brewing and three days drinking, followed by another three days of each. So I still had almost two weeks left, and time to consider what I wanted to obtain from the Tapari by barter and take back to Switzerland. In my bags and boxes on the shelf over my bed, more and more objects were accumulating. Bows, arrows, espadas, a stone axe, and other strange tools made of bone, rodents' teeth, snail shells, fire borers, spindles, needles of palm, wood, and eight bone, pretty combs, spoons from fruit husks, cooking ladles, carved stools, hammocks, string bags, work bags, ornaments of all sorts, wind instruments, and bone whistles, anything on which the Tapari had bestowed particular care, or which had entailed a lot of work, they did not part from without first eating their breath, as they called it, with ceremonious gestures, during that long period, their breath had entered into these objects, and on no account was I allowed to carry it away with me. They had to swallow it again with magic gesticulations. Many of the men and women found it hard to part from their belongings. The magicians, in particular, were sad to lose the equipment which they had employed in the ritual of raising spirits. But everyone received a fair price and seemed satisfied with the bargain. I still had a little time left to pursue one other matter. I was able to make tactful further inquiries about the spirits with which the Tapari believed the sky to be peopled and the origin of man as they conceived it. And in this way I learned many more surprising things.